Paul, who has now up until this point thought that Jesus was a heretic. Uh, he not only was happy about the fact that Jesus had been killed, but he, was, he had taken on the responsibility of killing, going around killing all the people that had interaction or had, were, were looking at going the same way that Jesus went. So he was highly invested in Jesus not being the person that he was about to encounter. And yet when we see in, the, in the, the, the terminology there, we see Paul going through and saying, who are you, comma, Lord. And that word Lord is the word kurios. And uh, kurios is really a, is a mental word. And it's even interesting because I always thought that Paul said this the other way around. I always thought that he said, Lord, who are you? Uh, but he didn't say that. If you could imagine this encounter, right? Uh, Paul is walking along the road and all of a sudden a bright light from heaven opens up and the next thing you know, Jesus is standing in front of him. It would be the normal experience for me to say, who are you? That's normal. I mean, you would be, you know, encountering this guy. And then it's almost like this comma sits a moment where Paul is starting to realize this is a serious encounter that I'm having here. And that's where the word curios comes from. Like two people can meet each other in, in, you know, at the Starbucks, and then all of a sudden, when you meet that person, you realize something about that person. And it's a super important moment in each one of our lives, super important in Paul's life here, but it's a super important moment in all of our lives as we are walking forward in the journey that God has, us in, has for us in Christianity. You see, what he's saying there, when he says the word curios, he's realizing that the person who is standing in front of him, this may hurt, is his superior. And by using that word curios, because it's kind of a curious word, curios, and that is that it, it really is, it, although they do assign it to titles, you know, so that if you are the king or you are the emperor or, you know, even God himself, you kind of give you him the term that it's kind of like, okay, you are the boss, you're the jefe. But it's a moment in each one of our lives when we realize, in fact, what is going on. Even if Paul, you're watching Paul do it here, that this person who's in front of me is my superior. In the chain of, in the pecking order, he's the boss. That's what you're doing when you say this term, curios. You're saying, I recognize and I am declaring to you that I am subjugating myself. I said, you know, I know we're gonna have to unpack some of this. I locked the doors, so don't even think about leaving. It's a moment when Paul is realizing I'm not the boss here. And he is allowing himself, like if a king walked into the room or, you know, somebody that is your hero or somebody that is, you know, you know, this person is up here and I'm down here. Now realize, I'm not saying that we're not all equals. We're not all important. God didn't love us all. That's not the point. We'll get to the minute. The point of the matter is, is that we're watching Paul, who is probably the top dog, He's certainly the top dog in his band of posse, the guys that are traveling around there. He's obviously a pretty important guy in the temple and in the Jewish you know, pecking order of things. He's used to being the smartest guy in the room. He's used to being the guy that gets to do whatever he wants. And then in that moment, that's how it is in my mind. You know, of course, you know, he's knocked onto the floor at this time, but... You can sort of see him as he's saying, well, who are you, Lord? He's putting himself underneath this person that is right in front of him. And that's probably, in, for most of our lives, that's not a comfortable thing for us to do. It's not normal for human beings. Or is, can I tell you something? You weren't even created to do that. The reason that we struggle so much with this whole concept of submission or this concept of putting ourselves under another person is because we were never designed to do that. You have inside of you the DNA of God himself. You were created as a sovereign being. 
You were created to be an independent, powerful force in your own right. But that doesn't remove the fact that there is a part of this journey that we are on that in fact becomes easier when we allow ourselves, like Paul is here, to say, Lord, and put ourselves underneath. And we'll begin to discover a little bit of what that, what that talks about. The concept of under submission. Can I, can I tell you something? It's probably not a more distasteful concept. Pastor Alex actually named the series, he called it Dangerous Prayers. I think this is more dangerous teachings. <laughs> because of the concept uh, that we have to unpack here when it comes to submission. I'm gonna try and do a little bit about, a little bit work with that today. When we're talking, first of all, when you are talking about submission or, or subjugating yourselves, subjugating your soul, which is it's going to prove to be in, enormously important in our lives, that we are not those people that are fighting against the Lord for our entire Christianity. But uh, submission or putting yourself under another person, can I tell you, it cannot be a forced thing. And this is where we have perhaps got in trouble with religion is because we have tried to force people to come into a place where they are subservient to either the religion or the doctrine or however we've kind of defined that in the seasons of the past. And that's created an enormous problem for us because eventually a forced subjugation is going to produce rebellion. That's not, that's not maybe is gonna happen. That's going to happen. You all heard the story of the, of the little boy who's in the, in the classroom with his teacher and the teacher tells him to sit down and he says, well, I might be sitting down on the outside, but I'm standing up on the inside, right? But that's not real submission. That's not really where we wanna be when it comes to understanding what Paul has been going through in his life right here. As a matter of fact, you're, you're, you're going to almost fool everybody around you because you are in fact seated on the outside. So everybody thinks this is working but in fact, every time the Lord comes and the Lord gives instructions, it's a fight. Simply because we haven't been able to find our way through to this place. And so, anyways. So, um, it's important to note here, because I, th- I wanted to really look at why is it so important for us or difficult for us to enter into this place of submission or to put ourselves underneath another human being. What's important, and I think, was that If you quickly read your scripture again there, you're gonna discover that Jesus did not knock Paul off that horse. He did not knock Paul to the ground. Paul fell to the ground. And sometimes we think that when we try to understand all of these principles of submission, particularly that God is knocking us to the ground. Can I tell you something? God would never knock anybody to the ground it kind of goes against the reason that God even made us to be sovereign beings in the first place. Why would God make us to be sovereign beings only to take away our sovereignty? You see, when I force somebody to be submitted, I am taking away their sovereignty. I'm taking away their right to choose. I'm using force or I'm using fear or I'm using a whole bunch of other manipulative techniques in order to get a person to submit, at least to appear to submit. But can I tell you something? It doesn't work like that. Submitting to another person is kind of like the same thing that just happened to Paul here as he has this interaction with Jesus on the road to Damascus. He just became so aware somehow of this being that was in front of him that his automatic reaction was to realize, I'm not the boss. I'm not the, I'm not the smartest guy in the room right now. And he brought himself into that place of submission to, to Jesus. I, I wanna be able to go through a bunch of scriptures. I hope you guys brought your, your page flipping fingers with you this morning. Because I wanna show you something in scripture that it's perhaps going to startle you. And that is that when Jesus was here on this planet, now there are a couple of exceptions that I'm gonna gonna share with you at the end just so that I make sure that you have a thorough list. But can I tell you something? When Jesus was here, he did not uh, 
when he was performing miracles, he did not take away people's sovereignty when he did that. And a lot of the times, perhaps because we've heard a lot of teachings that are, you know, of a different style, we haven't realized that Jesus didn't force his miracles on anybody. And so let's take a look at a couple of these if we can. Let me just, I'm just going to skip ahead in my notes just because I'm excited to get there. Oh, I want to do this first. Because we're supposed to use props. When you deal with this concept that we're talking about as in Jesus is Lord... There's, a, there's an issue of trajectory that we're dealing with when we are coming into the kingdom or walking forward with God in the kingdom. How many of you know that if I put my trajectory here, who's over there? Darian, that's excellent. You see how my trajectory here, oh. Nope. Look at the, oh. Sorry, Barbie. Oh, Carl's there too. I got two targets. Luke is there, right on. I I want you to notice the end of my gun. I'm only making just the slightest little change. Can you see that? In the trajectory. Who's over back over here? Who's there? Yeah, make sure we don't poke any eyes out back there, okay? Do we have ushers back there? Whoa. I want you to notice that I'm only making a very slight change to the end of my gun. (laughs) So, honey, how nice have you been to me lately? It doesn't take a lot of a change in the trajectory from where I start. Evidently, these things shoot 90 feet, and they're actually pretty close to 90 feet. It's only a slight change in the trajectory that really makes a dramatic change in where that little thingamajig, how many am I, how am I doing here? When that little thingamajig ends up. It's like that in our journey with the Lord. This concept of understanding how to put ourselves underneath Jesus in an, in, so that our soul never decides it's going to be the boss. It makes the process so much easier for us. And so, I think I'd like to keep that, by the way. And so anyways, let's take a look at some of these scriptures. If you want to go with me to, um, in John chapter 5, maybe let, let me just do this. Let me just read it to you. You'll, I think you, most of you will have remembered the story. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And now there was in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. And in these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, par- paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. And now there was a certain man who had an infirmity for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there, he knew that he already had been in that condition for quite some time. And he said to him, listen to this, what do you want to be made well? How many of you uh, were were back in your blasphemous days ever watched the movie uh, Life of Brian? Monty Python. You're, you're, I'm British, so it's kind of a rite of passage. It was, it's a funny, funny scene in that movie where Jesus, Brian, in the, in the situation, was a fake, whatever, you have to watch the movie. And he went along and he just was bopping everybody on the head, giving them all miracles, and he was getting sued by the people who he got miracles for because the people didn't want the miracles. And that kind of stuck with me. And then when I'm looking at what Jesus is doing here, now realize what's happening. One... If you know where the Sheep's Gate is, the Sheep's Gate is one of the main entrances into the temple area and the one where you would typically go through if you were coming from areas north of Jerusalem, which is where Jesus would have been coming from. So safe to say, Jesus passed by this gate all the time. It's not a gate like at a farm. It's like a gate, like a big, huge archway that you would come through. And beside this archway, there is a pool. And beside this pool, there is this whole multitude of people who are, as the the scripture tells us here, who are all very sick. So there's a couple of things that we want to notice here. There wasn't only one person there. I know you've all heard the scripture and Jesus healed them all. We're going to get to that scripture in a minute. But 
Imagine this moment in your mind's eye where Jesus is interacting with this enormous group of people. It would, who knows if it was as many people as are in this room right now. And then it says that he zeroed in on this one certain person. Of all the sick folk in the room, he zeroed in on one person. And you'd think now Jesus, he's all knowing. Probably the guy had obvious issues that you, Jesus could have guessed. But he says to the person, would you like to be made well? Doesn't that strike you as a little bit unusual? It's a waste of time, first of all, because I think the, the question is obvious. You'd think it was obvious. But Jesus waited for that person's answer before he interacted with that person in, in a way of miracle. He did not take away that person's sovereign right to stay the way they were to, in a sense, opt out of the opportunity that Jesus was making available to them. It's interesting. And so take a look at, take a look at another one here in uh, Matthew chapter 8. And when evening have come, they brought, they brought him many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. Again, the people's families or friends would have brought these people willingly into Jesus's presence for the express purpose of him helping or healing them. So again, in that situation, Jesus did not take their sovereignty. He just didn't go to the hospital and just go shazam like a wizard and fire came out of his fingertips and everybody in the hospital got healed. It's a super important designation when we understand that Jesus is actually going to require us, uh, except for a couple exceptions, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. He's going to require us to give him permission. He's requiring us to opt into this process. If we don't opt into this process, he's not going to force us to do something that we have not already expressed that we are willing to do. Can I tell you something? Submitting to the Lord doesn't change his power and control over you. It's not like he's like freaking out because he doesn't have a contract with you. He's God. He can go back to the beginning again and not create you. <laughs> so don't think... There's some great advantage to God. He's all of a sudden, oh, finally, I've got this control over you. No, it's not, it's not how it works. Matter of fact, he doesn't have any less or any more control over you. He's not interested in having control over you. If he wanted to control you, he would have made you an automaton, which he could do. Instead, he gave us the ability to have a free will. He gave us the ability to decide who and who not to submit to. Who are we going to put ourselves underneath and who are we not going to put ourselves underneath? Look at this over in when Jesus cleansed the leper. It's in Luke chapter five. And it happened when he went into a certain city that behold, a man who was full of leprosy, full of leprosy. And Jesus, and he saw Jesus and he fell on his face and he implored him saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Or it's not clear on the translation there. I think it goes the other way around. I think he said, Lord, if you are willing, can you make me clean? And then he put out his hand, Jesus put out his hand and touched him and said, I am willing. You see what happened there, what maybe we didn't notice was that the person who was coming to Jesus to get a miracle first gave Jesus the opportunity to, uh, to the permission to be able to do that and to be able to have him step into that place. In, in, uh, in Mark chapter 10, and now there came to Jericho and he came out of, and when he was out of Jericho with his disciples, a great multitude, including blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. And when he had heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. That's a reference to him being the Messiah in the mind of blind Bartimaeus. And then many warned him to be quiet and he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And when he had called the blind man, saying to him, be of good cheer, rise there, the master is calling you. And throwing aside his garment, he rose to Jesus. And Jesus looked at him and said to him, obviously you're a blind guy, you want me to heal you, right? No. 
Jesus said to blind Bartimaeus, what do you want me to do for you? And then Bartimaeus replied, Lord, I would receive my sight. You see what Jesus is waiting for and you see it over and over and over and over again in the scriptures when Jesus is interacting with people, even though he's coming to them and he's gonna give them a million dollars, he first says to them, would you like a million dollars? Because he's not assuming, not seizing hold of that person's sovereign might to choose or to opt in or opt out if they so choose. And sometimes we get this all wrong. We feel like, you know, it's not hard to submit to somebody as long as they're not requiring you to submit to them. We feel like God is requiring us, because it kind of sounds like that in Scripture. It's like, you know, you know the sons of disobedience. Or that's, they, there's not a lot of positive scriptures in reference to those guys. And so he's kind of like he's forcing us or we can feel that he's forcing us into this place of submission. There is nothing that's gonna cause you to resist submission more than some, the sense that somebody's forcing you to do it. Our mindset on these things, because of so many years of religion and being, you know, that the, the forces trying to cause us to come into a place of submission, that we've just got such a habit of resisting that. And probably everybody in this room would say, I have no interest in resisting God. I have no interest in, in not learning the stuff that I need to learn. I have no interest in, in staying the way that I am. I, I have no interest in not growing. But you see, what we have to do is we have to flip that little switch on the inside of us that says, you know, I'm not afraid to be submitted to somebody who is not requiring of me to submit to them. In fact, we have this situation, if you remember the woman with the issue of blood, when it comes to permission, we've kind of actually got the sucker backwards. Because when we observe this woman here, and it, but he, as he went, the multitudes throng him, and now a woman having an issue of blood for 12 years who had spent all of her livelihood on physicians and could not be healed by any of them, came from behind and touched the hem of Jesus' garment, and immediately her flow of blood stopped. And Jesus said, who touched me? That's crazy, huh? Just think about that for a moment. And Jesus said, who touched me? You'd think that that woman was gonna ask permission. You think that he, she would come up and say, excuse me, Jesus, would you be able to lay your hands on me so that I can get healed? She didn't do that. She actually, she took it from him without permission. Was Jesus mad about that? You know, did, was there lightning bolts that came down from heaven? No. You see, God is not, does not have a problem with us taking things even without asking permission. I mean, here, let me clarify. <laughs> from him. <laughs> but let me tell you something, God would never do that to us. Let me just make sure that so that when you're doing all of your homework, you realize that there are a couple times when Jesus actually didn't ask permission. Do you remember that time when Jesus was wandering and they were just talking and they, they saw this blind person that was right there and said, you know, whose fault is it that this man was born blind? Do you remember that part of the scripture? And you know, Jesus didn't ask that guy permission. He just healed them. Because the answer to the question of by what, by what reason is this man blind, the answer to the question was so that the glory of God could be demonstrated. So the power of God could be demonstrated. That's the only, now the couple other situations, but that's the only one where the person had the potential. Now he might have not, he might have not been competent. He might not have even, you know, might not have been able to figure stuff out for himself. I don't, I don't know when we don't know. But Jesus didn't even make any attempt to get permission from that guy. Right. I think the message of this particular example, because it's the only time it ever does this in scripture, was to, to let us know, it's not that God can't force you to step into a miracle. No, he can absolutely force you to do that. He just doesn't. He wants us to know that his power is, is supreme and sovereign over all the powers that are there. But can I tell you something? You don't have to be afraid of God making you bow before him. That's, he's completely not interested in that. And there's a couple other examples where you have demonically possessed people who are out of their minds. Remember the demoniac of the Gadarenes, right? He said, Jesus says, why, the, 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 he said to Jesus, why have you come to torment us? Right. When somebody talks to you in the plural, 
you know there's potentially a problem here. And so Jesus recognizing that that person wasn't even in their right mind. And the other guy was Lazarus. How many of you remember Lazarus? He, was, he had this terrible medical condition called dead. dead. And so he also didn't, wasn't able to get permission from Lazarus as to whether he wanted to come back to life or not. But you see, it's very specifically, if the person is competent, if they are able to make a decision for themselves, God is very interested in you coming to the place where you would answer the question, Lord, what would you have me do for you? Excuse me, him asking you that. What would you have me do for you? And determine in your own self, I have come to God because I am looking for him to bring me to this place. I am giving him permission. I'm opting into a process. I recognize that it, you know, if it's between me and him, he's the smart one in the room. And I'm easily coming to that place where I'm not going to fight against him anymore. It's super interesting. Now, if you go back to Acts chapter nine there, Paul is interacting with Jesus now for the first time. He's just got knocked to the ground by this flashing bright light. He says to the Lord, who are you? Jesus answered him and says this, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. You'd think there was going to be something super enduring that comes next. And I just love you so much. I've been waiting to meet you for such a long time. Can I tell you that's not what Jesus says? Jesus says, Paul, why are you kicking against the goads? Now, we don't use the word goads anymore, but what goads are is long pieces of metal with points on the end, like a prod. And what they would do with these things is if you were herding cattle, this is probably a little gross for all of you people who love cows, in order to get the cows to move, you would kind of poke them with this little prick, they called it, and what Jesus is saying to him is, why do you keep backing, on, backing up onto the goads? Why do you keep backing up onto the needle? Why are you making this process so hard for yourself? I think that what Jesus is trying, and it's crazy that this is the first thing that Jesus has to say to Paul. It's kind of like he's saying, you know, Paul, if you were looking to find God, if you were looking to find significance, if you were looking to find peace, if you were looking to find treasure, if you were looking to find significance, if you were looking to find any of these things, you're going the wrong way. And Jesus wanted to come to him in that very moment of just saying hello to him and saying, I need you to know going that way is going to be super hard for you and it's going to hurt. Jesus wanted him to know that there is a divine order to the way things work. And if we are constantly going to go through our lives trying to find the wrong way to do it, trying to figure it out on our own, trying to work out all the details and trying to become smart enough to get all of our dominoes standing up and all of our plates spinning all at the same time. Jesus is saying, Paul, that's the hardest way to get there. What you want to do is you want to go this way. What's Paul's answer? Paul's answer to Jesus is, Jesus, what would you like me to do? You see, what had happened in this process of really coming to the place where he could put put himself underneath the, the wisdom and the mantle of Jesus, something that he could not see or understand, all of a sudden was as plain as day to him. He couldn't see a moment ago that he was going in exactly the wrong direction, but now all of a sudden he could see, whoop, this is the way I need to go. What happens to us when we put our soul in subjection to a, a, you know, a higher person, like a higher, whatever, being, whatever. Can I tell you something? 
How many of you know we got a little bit of a problem in the stock market last couple days? Anybody watch that stuff? How many of you'd like to go get on the phone with Warren Buffett right now and find out how he feels about this? Can I tell you something? It's super confusing what to do. It's super confusing whether you should buy this or sell it or, you know, hold it or whatever. But you know when you get, you submit yourself, get Warren on the phone and say, what would you do? You know, it's, it's become so clear. That's how that process works, is that in ourselves we can end up with so much confusion. Can I tell you what humans do when they are confused? Do they run forward in great excitement and exhilaration? They don't. When you're confused, you stop. Maybe even back up. And that's what Paul was doing as he keeps getting these goads in his backside. Because of the confusion and you back up and you back up and you back up. You know, can I tell you, God is not, not, not looking for you to back up. He's looking for you to go forward. He's looking for you to go and get hold of that thing that he has for you in life. But just like my little Nerf gun there, if we don't make this trajectory change and really put ourselves in a place where we're not fighting with God anymore, I'm telling you, you're going to get yourself on the grease tracks. Let me just f finish off by this couple of minutes that I have left here today. Let me share you with just a couple of things that when it comes to the, this amazing prayer that comes right after the prayer, Lord, or at least a little while after that, is when we begin to understand, you know, Lord, what I really need you to do, I really need you to change me. You know, God is not going to do that until he has your prayer to do so. He's totally good with just blasting you with miracles for the rest of your life. And so when we're taking a look at what happens right after you say these words, Lord, change me. There's a three-step process. I'm going to go through it really quickly. Galatians chapter four, if you want to go grab your scripture there. One, you have to submit to the Lord. Can I tell you, a submi true submission is not based on violence, not based on force. It's based on love and trust. And an acceptance or a reverence to the other person's superiority. And so when we're able to do that, is that I know God loves me. I know I'm safe. I know he's never going to steal my sovereignty. He's going to share with me everything that I'm, is going to be part of my journey. And so I'm good with the journey. Number two, and it tells us that God gives us guardians and tutors. Uh, epitropos, which is kind of like a person who looks after your manners and your lifestyle and your character. And oikonoimos, which is the people, the person who keeps all the rules and laws in the household. And so there is this season that we step into where God puts boundaries around us and he kind of helps us with a whole bunch of structure as we begin to walk through some of these things. Can I tell you something? This process of understanding or perceiving something because of our place of submission, we can perceive new things, which then gets to understand new things, which then we can believe new things, which then means our lives can change. And through this process of coming to the Lord and saying, Lord, I would really like to get rid of my anger problem, or I'd really like to have more money, or I'd really like to not get sick in February. I'd really like some of these things. Can you change? show me what I need to change? Simple prayers. Then realize that just put yourself underneath him. He's the boss. Don't fight with him anymore. Surround yourself with people, with tutors and guardians who are just going to be able to help you through your journey. And then Galatians says, and then when the appointed time arrives, the Father, as it were, will release you. Can I tell you when that time, uh, when that time arrives? Is when you no longer, when you automatically make the same decisions as your tutors and guardians, even though they don't help you. When you, are, when you have come into that place now where they've helped you to understand how to be, you know, have your needs met or how to live well, healthy or, you know, how to have good relationships or how to whatever it is that you're looking to do, after a while of working with your tutors and guardians, as it were, you just start doing the right things. They don't need to correct you. They don't need to have the corral there anymore. They can start taking the corral off and you're good to go. It's such a simple process. After we have made that decision to say, Lord, I'm submitting myself to you. I'm allowing you to be the boss. I'm allowing you to take the lead. And I'm coming to you and say, Lord, change me. Put your hand over your heart and say, Heavenly Father, 
I'm so desiring to get my trajectory right. I know you're the boss. I'm not disputing that. But I am saying I might have a little trouble submitting myself to you. And so right now, I'm setting the record straight. You are my Lord. You're the boss. You're the jefe. You are the supreme being. And I'm allowing my soul to very comfortably opt in to this beautiful place submitted to you. And from this place, change me. Help me to see what you see so that I can understand, so that I can believe, so that my life can change. In Jesus' name. Thanks so much for joining us today. We pray that your life was impacted by this service and you are able to feel the tangible love of Jesus fill whatever space you're listening from. Maybe you found this message and you've never had the opportunity to come into a personal relationship with Jesus, or you've known about him, but been far from him. We wanna give you the opportunity to make his love a daily reality in your life. Jesus came to this earth and died on the cross so that you could be close to him. He wanted to wipe away every disappointment and bring you into a life of purpose and meaning one that will impact this globe for good. If you'd like to begin this journey with Jesus today, then just repeat this simple prayer after me. Dear Jesus, I'm praying this prayer because I know that I've made mistakes and been living without you. I apologize and I trust that you will forgive me. I accept your love and grace and ask that you would be my savior and my Lord. Help me believe in you and love you every day and help me to show the world what you're like and how great your love is. I commit to live for you from this moment forward. In Jesus' name, amen. All of our Light City family are joining with heaven and celebrating over the commitment you have just made to make Jesus the Lord of your life. We have resources available for you to help you on this journey. And most of all, we're praying for you. Send us a note at info at golightcity.com to let us know about the decision you've made today. We have resources we would love to send you with some easy steps on where to go from here so that you can discover God in a real and meaningful way. If you have a prayer request, our team would love to connect with you and partner with you to see God transform your life. God bless you and we look forward to hearing from you real soon.